What's up, guys? How you doing? Here once again for episode two of Channel Chasers, the rebooted edition. Uh, so we hope you guys enjoyed our Crisis on Infinite Earths podcast. That was a lot of fun. We did not expect, you know, as much love for a two-hour podcast. But thank you, nonetheless, to everybody who, you know, checked it out yes. over on the Comic Universe YouTube channel. That was great. In- indeed. Um, as of recording, currently has 49 views. Yeah, so thank you very much. And to anyone yeah. new, because, you know, we have recently expanded... Uh, thanks to uh, the help of the Anchor app. So thank you very much, Anchor. I've already recorded the ad for it, so you probably are going to hear it soon anyway. Uh, but yeah, now that we're on Anchor, we are able to distribute to a bunch of different podcast platforms. So in case you guys are new, hey, what's up? My name is Jay, and of course here is my co-host, Brian. Say hello to the new people, Brian. Hello, new people. So in case you didn't watch or listen to the trailer... This podcast is all about TV. We talk about our strong opinions on different TV shows. Normally, you know, Brian is the light side and I'm more of the pessimistic. I got to be honest, that kind of sucked side. So, you know, yeah, that's kind I'm, of our back and forth. I'm the, well, there was this good part about it. Yeah, so... You know, now that you're a little familiar with our dynamic, let's talk about what our topic is this week. And uh, this episode is actually, you know, going to be posted on Christmas Eve. So happy holidays to everybody. Uh, Just, you know, as a heads up. And our gift to you is a discussion on one of my favorite Marvel TV shows of all time and one of my favorite comic book teams of all time. Uh, Marvel's Runaways, season three. Unfortunately, ditto, the final season. Ditto minus the comics part because I hadn't read all of it yet. But yeah, um, you know, Runaways Season 3 is our main subject for today's episode. And I gotta be honest, guys, I literally... I'm still processing some feelings. A lot of feelings. Yeah, I I honestly just watched it earlier today, too. And I can tell you, I am very mad. So, you know, because we, you know, didn't have a chance to do anything on the first season. Well, we did on my, our previous incarnation of Channel Chasers. But anybody who missed that episode, let's kind of give just a brief overview of our thoughts on the first season. And uh, what we liked and what we didn't like about it. Uh, go ahead, Brian, you start first. Well, um, it's been a few years, so forgive me if I forget a few things, but I I remember hearing about this. Um, Jay was really pumped because, like he said, big fan of the comic, and I just like superhero stuff and teen stuff, so I was like, okay, give it a shot. I knew about the comic, but I didn't actually, like, read much of it. Um, I ended up reading a comic that's kind of semi-tied to it, but we might talk about that later. Um, but, but yeah, so I went in with very low expectations, very low, like, knowing what's going on. I mean, I knew the basics, like, everyone and their powers... Uh, things you can find out from, like, Google searches. Because uh, I'm just that type of nerd. Um, when I don't read something, I Google it. But, um, yeah, so I was like, okay, give it a shot. Watched it, really liked it. Then I was like, how the heck are they going to resolve that plot point? And then... Oh, boy. Oh, by the way, uh, in case you haven't already, since we're going to be talking about Season 3, there are going to be spoilers for Seasons 1 and 2, and we are going to eventually jump into a spoiler portion for Season 3, but we'll give you guys fair warning when we get there. Indeed. But yeah, continue, Brian. Spoiler. uh, I'm the... uh, 
I just said spoiler because you said spoiler. I've had a long day. But anyway, um, then... That's what editing's for, Brian. Season one ended, and I was like, how the heck are they going to resolve that? And then they resolved it, and went even further down the rabbit hole of awesomeness and weirdness. And if you know me, I love weirdness. So this was right up my alley. And I actually recognize a few actors and I really like how they're doing. And you're thinking at the end of season two, how are they going to finish that? And then, oh boy, they again rinse and repeat about what I just said about season two, but more so. But you also get the sadness of going into it knowing that it's the last season. Honestly, so. this is this is the one that I think could continue. And I think if, you know, fans really rally and, you know, it's shown a lot more, uh, maybe it can continue on Disney Plus. Because, I mean, Hulu is owned by Disney. So maybe I'm still holding out hope. I hope it can. Um, but uh, if if yeah. I'm being honest, without without spoiling it, I think they did give a satisfying ending. But oh, yeah. but just but for the fact that I love the, yeah. but I love the show, and the cliffhanger, I really want to see it resolved. And oh yeah, I definitely think want to see more of these awesome characters. Yeah, I definitely think you know it was a satisfying conclusion, but they left just enough room in case it gets renewed on like a Disney Plus or you know Hulu decides okay we'll bring you back because we liked you because I think well, Runaways did the best out of the like the Loeb shows yeah but see the fact is that Loeb got, is no longer there and Marvel yeah. TV is no longer there yeah that's true so probably not but you know what it ended satisfyingly. So let me go ahead and tell you guys a little bit about my history with the Runaways. So it's actually really funny. I was about eight or nine years old when this comic series first started over a decade ago. Oh, God, it started over a decade ago. I think it was like 2003 or 2004, something like that. Um, and I was in the comic shop and I was looking at the new releases and on the cover of this comic, I saw a girl with a dinosaur. And I was like, holy crap, what is this dinosaur? Why is there a witch chick? That guy has cool robot hands. What is this? Let me read it. And that's how it happened. The rest is history. I absolutely love the Runaways. Uh, they are one of my favorite teams in all of comics. I love every single member. Gert. Molly, Chase, Carolina. No, it is not pronounced Carolina, and you cannot change my mind about it. And of course, you know the uh, you know the honorary members like Zavin, Victor, uh, Rose, who you know we will never see, but Victor was name dropped. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. Uh, I I love this team so much. I followed them wherever they went. Civil War tie-in, Avengers Arena, all that stuff. Loved it. Avengers Academy, loved it. These characters are some of the only Marvel characters that were actually allowed to age and grow. They started out as teenagers, and eventually they became like college kids, post-grad kids, and now just full-on adults. So... Like, it's a very rare case within the Marvel Universe, so I really am appreciative of it. And, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a team created by Brian K. Vaughn, and if you guys are familiar with comics at all, you know this guy is brilliant. Yep. And this so, was one of those This was one of those things that rarely happens in, like, mainstream comics, where it's just like, they were like, creator, give you the reins. You can do it's one, whatever it's, it's you one, want. It's one of those sad things, right? It's one of those sad things where a lot of people, like the, the Runaways, is this you know, cult hit that you know so many people love, but and you know a lot of people wanted to try and you know recapture it, but after Vaughn's 
initial run, you know, no one was able to really recapture the magic after that. Hell, Whedon even gave it a try and gave us one of the weirdest, honestly, in my opinion, worst runs of the Runaways to date. However, Rainbow Rao and her recent run of Runaways is absolutely phenomenal. You can tell that she was a fan of the original comics. And I'm not just saying that because she put Nico and Carolina together like they should have been all along. But no offense, Julie. I love you. I love the power pack. But why am I speaking to a fictional character? Because I'm just that kind of guy. Yeah. But anyway, uh, the show itself. I am kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum with Brian. I went in with super high expectations. I've been following the developments of this show for years. It was originally supposed to be a movie. Then it was going to be a show on FX. That got shelved. That got shelved. And eventually, after like three different retools, it got picked up by Hulu. And then that's when we got the incarnation we got, you know, today. And it was I it was the say, OG Titans. Yep. <laughs> and I gotta say, man, I loved what we got. Because, you know, in in the comics, the story, rightfully so, was all about the kids and their dynamics. So you know, we focused a lot on their new family, their found family. And their parents were more just one-dimensional, evil for the <laughs> sake of evil, bad guys. But the show spends a lot more time on Pride. It helps humanize them, make them more characters, and makes a lot of them really likable. So, like, I really appreciated the show for that. And the show also takes interesting turns so that, like, you know, comic fans can't just predict everything that happens. Obviously, they stick to the major plot points, but they still keep the essence of the character. Now, my general thoughts on season one, loved it. I absolutely loved it. I loved the changes they made. The only thing I didn't like about season one personally was the take they had on Molly. And that is nothing against the actress (laughs) at all. But, like, you know, she was still trying to find her footing, and it didn't feel like Molly. And personally, I have... A like a deeper attachment to Molly, even though she's not my favorite runaway. Molly was my age when I first started reading the comics, so like Molly was the character that I related to. So of course, like you know, I I've got a soft spot for Molly, and you know I was fine with them aging her up because I feel like it would have been weird, like show wise, for them to have a nine year old with them. But uh, you know, uh, I I think. She didn't really have Molly's same personality that I like grew to love in the comics. But you see that personality shine through a lot more in season two and definitely in season three. Like she mm-hmm. felt one hundred and ten percent like Molly by the time of the final season. And I am very happy to report that as a huge fan of the character. Definitely those last couple episodes from what I know of yep. comic Molly. Yep, and I mean, like, they nailed every single one of the other characters. Alex is so on point. Nico is damn near perfect. Like, I feel like Nico's actress is the best actress of the entire cast, at least the team Mm -hmm. cast. Uh, Then you got Carolina. Carolina is amazing. Uh, Probably my second favorite character of the team. Um, And I I love her Talk about character character growth. Yeah, they handle her so well. Love her. Love her so much. Chase. Chase has always just kind of been there for me. I like Chase, but he's never been my favorite whatsoever. I think <laughs> I think season three was when he, it, he's just starting to shine, which is sad. Yeah. Which, I mean, but I mean, that's kind of the same for comic Chase, too. I didn't actually start liking Chase until, like, recently or in more recent stuff like Avengers Arena and all that. So, like, I feel like, again, that just plays to the, to the, that just shows that Greg Sulkin is really just playing to the character really well. Which is weird, and, though, because because um, it's kind of, like, correlated story-wise, like, you liking him. <laughs> I'll just say yeah, that. Yeah, right? Yeah, it is a little weird. Um, but, 
all the one character that I think they did so much better in the show uh, than they did in uh, than the comic version is Alex Wilder. Mm-hmm. Because in in uh, so spoiler for the comics, but they're over a decade old. If you haven't read it, you're probably not going to read it. But Alex Wilder is just kind of the mole, the bad guy, the one who betrays the group and kind of like you know fractures them and you know she's the cat he is the catalyst to push Nico into her leadership role um and, but he didn't really have much beyond that right in the show he has a lot more personality he's a lot more likable and you understand his motivations a lot more like sure you can definitely see he's the darkest like mentality wise of the entire team but you also get why he is that way. Mm-hmm. And, and again, the biggest change from the comics to the TV show are the parents. The parents are so much better. Uh, you really get to understand them. You get to feel for them as much as you kind of hate them in the beginning, which you're supposed to hate them. But by, by the time, especially of season three, you're like, I'm so glad you guys actually got a chance to redeem yourselves because I like you, especially well, you, Dale. Dale doesn't some get of them. credit. Some of them got well, a chance to redeem. I mean, I feel Most like all of them. Of them I'm, I feel like all of them put in work except for uh, except for one. But you know, I honestly didn't think uh, that character uh, was going to get a redemption arc. If I'm being honest. Which oh. is ironic because they start off as, do you think, the one good parent. Yep. But seriously, though, real quick, shout out to Dale. Dale is the best parent. Yes. Um, Love Dale. I actually, I actually know of that actor. Like, he's been in a lot of TV. Um, if you've ever heard of the show uh, Scorpion... I have, yeah, the hacking one. He actually, he actually comes in in the later seasons as like a not smart person anchor to the team. Oh, that's cool. But yeah, no, I which feel is like ironic Dale is though because, character. which is ironic though because on Runaways he's so darn smart. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Uh. But yeah, um, if I had to rank the parents, I think definitely my favorite parents, of course, are Dale and Stacy because they're just so freaking weird. Yes. Um, Stacy definitely has more of her comic counterparts, like crazy side than Dale. Dale is just like, I don't know why I'm here, guys, but I'm here. He gets a little crazy towards the midway of season three, but yeah. Um, I also, I, I love Alex's dad, Mr. Wilder, Jeffrey Wilder. Um, yeah. and man, if you want to talk about like taking an actor and like just matching them straight to the page, that mm-hmm. actor looks exactly like, exactly like the like rendition of Jeffrey Wilder from the comics. Like I was kind of like shocked. They yeah, look exactly the same, and I'm like, that's crazy. Uh, and he is probably like the best parent, but he also has like the shadiness to him. But like, he's the one I felt for the most. Yeah, besides Dale. Um, yeah, he and... he was a good like um, skirt the line type character. Dale yep. Dale was always just like seemed to be doing what he thought was right type guy. Yep. But Jeffrey was and I, definitely... And I, and, I, and I feel like that's the same for Robert Minoru, uh, Nico's dad. Like, you know, yeah. he only, he was he was doing what he think was right and, you know, what he thought could protect his kids. I mean, that's the kind of the common theme for all the parents. Uh, but mm-hmm. Robert, he just was somebody who made like one mistake and like kind of had to pay for it. Like, probably the worst. Mm-hmm. And then, hey, uh, you know. um, oh, just a little, little behind the scenes fun fact for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
the actor who played uh, Nico's dad actually was an extra in uh, Daredevil. That's cool. Um, so let's talk about Tina. T- Tina is that character out of the parents that just I I love to hate her for a long time. You eventually like start to feel for her, but like for a while she's just kind of the sexy evil mom. Yep. Um. In- but indeed, like... indeed, and uh, fun fact about her. Uh, she's the voice actress of Karai. Oh, that's so cool. Nice. Uh, in the, in the current Ninja Turtles cartoon? Um, in both of them. Um, that's not... No, because Kelly Hugh was the Karai in the 2012. Well, uh, she was Karai in uh, Out of the Shadows and then the current one, I believe. Gotcha. The the twenty fourteen. She did. Gotcha, gotcha. That makes sense. So, uh, yeah. So, Tina, I I really like her because again, she connects us to like the wider. She's the one that probably connects us to the wider MCU the most because of her family's heritage, and they actually really go deep into magic, especially in season three. Um. Mm-hmm. So, that's really dope. Um. Now let's talk about the Steins. Victor is probably the male equivalent to Tina. I hated him for a very long time and, you know, mm. played by the wonderful Mr. Spike himself, J- you know, James Marsters. Indeed. Oh, boy. They definitely did a good job with casting Spike. And I mean, like, uh, Mr. Stein was always a dick. Because I mean, none of the none of the pride parents in the comics like physically abuse their kids at least, except for Victor, and so Victor was kind of always like the worst. They end up redeeming him, which I'm glad. But and and like they also address that abuse is a cycle, and like it's a very well done like theme. And I, again, like I'm glad that the parents got as much closure as the kids. Um, Janet, we're starting his to wife, slide into spoilers, by the way. Yeah. Just a, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, Janet, uh, Mrs. Stein, Victor's wife. Uh, I So in the first season, she's kind of just there, and she's kind of just mm-hmm. a victim of the abuse. And you're just kind of like, okay, you're just the person that Robert cheated with, and you know, you're being abused by your husband. You're not really doing anything. Season two comes around, you find out she's a super genius. And, uh, like, you know, she she still still doesn't do too much in season two. Yep. But then season three comes around and, like, Janet steps up big time. She's, like, one of the star parents. Yep. And so, last but certainly not least, we got to talk about my girl Carolina and her parents. Let's quickly address Frank. Frank was a character I liked and then quickly just ended up hating because he just became mm. horrible. So I don't really need to spend Indeed. too much time talking about Frank. Uh, but um, Leslie, though. What? I'm I'm honestly blanking on, like, what was the last time we saw Frank? He got murdered by Jonah. Oh. Yeah, right. Yep. So, yeah. Um, so Frank's dead. Uh, so we don't really need to talk about Frank. And he was no, kind of just killed on cer- ceremony. Frank, street. Frank, you thought was going to be the good, like, you're not my birth daughter, but you're still my daughter type character. But then but we just found out, out he's a self absorbed. Yeah, he's just a self absorbed, arrogant prick who only cares about fame and glory. So he's a fame whore. Fuck you, Frank. Yeah, fuck you, Frank. Let's talk about Leslie, though, man. Leslie was that one that I thought was going to be right up there with Tina, with all the mm-hmm. despicable shit that was going on. But, like, Leslie had probably the biggest turnaround of anyone. Because um, they even the show you, pack. like, Leslie, like, pulling the strings for, like, Tina yeah, and, and the you, others. And you, and you also, but you also get to see the, the most about Leslie, like, 
the fact that she was groomed from like childhood, which is disgusting. Um, mm-hmm. And she was raised in this religious cult and all that. So you cut you, again. You understand her a lot more. And I really loved her character turnaround and like again how she interacted with each of the kids and how each of the kids kind of had their own thing with Leslie. Um, it's really well done. I loved her character arc. Very solid. Um, so uh, this is the point where we are going to officially get into spoilers for season three. So if you have not seen this final season of Runaways, do yourself a favor. Watch the season first. Then, you know, come back to this podcast. You know, you can keep it paused on wherever you're listening to it on. And uh, come back and listen to the spoilers section as of right now. So, mm-hmm. holy shit. Season three. God damn. They went ham with this season. So Indeed. There's plenty of good I want to talk about, so I want to start by talking about what I didn't like. So, they spend a lot of time, like, in the first half. I feel like it's kind of two separate seasons mashed into one. And that's my only real problem with the third season. Because, like, the first season's all about, of course, dealing with the Gibbs and, you know, the Magistrate's family and stuff like that. And they do get dealt with but once they get dealt with, it's kind of just like a like a passing thing they mention every now and then. And it's just like, oh yeah, you know, they were killed. Like, we don't get to see how, really. We don't get any, like, we don't get any full-on confirmation, you know? Well, they don't say that they're dead, too. They just say they're gone. They're gone. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. You spent all this time building them up, and they're just, you know, gone. I feel like that's that's a little underwhelming. It's a little underwhelming. Well, also to be fair though, as like a counterpoint, because in case you guys didn't know, that's kind of like my job here. <laughs> um, season two kind of felt like two different seasons too. Remember? No, I, no, I definitely agree with that, and that like I'm that's it's a problem that's carried over. Like I had a problem with it last season as well. Yeah. Uh. Because, like, it was just a weird transition into the Morgana stuff. I mean, it worked for the most part. Like, I'm not going to say mm-hmm. it was horrible. But it was just a little weird, you know? I feel like kind of they knew going into it that they were going to Oh, yeah. Canned. Like, you can, you, yeah, you can tell because, like, they, they, they wrap up a lot of the arcs and they wrap them up very well. Uh, so... Let's go. Uh, where do you want to start? Parents or kids? We started with the parents for before, so let's go ahead and start with the kids. Which runaway do you want to start with first? Well, I mean, let's start with your least favorite or least favorite to begin with. Okay, so my least favorite from the show, Molly. Okay, yeah. So Molly, I, Molly, I loved in this season. Molly felt mm-hmm. way more like Molly. One of the biggest things that, like, I always have loved about Molly is that, like, unlike everybody else, like, you know, Nico does have a code name in the comics. She's Sister Grimm. Chase is kind of just Chase. Alex is just Alex. Gert has Arsenic as her code name, but nobody ever calls her Arsenic. She's just Gert. None of them ever use code names. But Molly, she is all about that life. She wants to be a superhero. She wanted to go to the, uh, the X Mansion, but then she was like, wait, I don't want to, you know, leave my family behind. But call me Princess Powerhouse. Like, yes, Molly was so cool. And, mm-hmm. like, I, I love that moment with Gert when, you know, Gert's talking about how she wants a normal life and she wants to go to college and, you know, do normal things after all this crazy magic shit is over. But, uh, you know, Molly's like, that's cool for you, Gert, but I don't want to do that. We're fucking superheroes. This is what I want to do. Don't you know how good it is to be superheroes? And it's so awesome. I want to punch things, Gert. Let me punch things. Yeah. And she's like, Like, don't you realize how awesome it is that we're superheroes? And like, you know... I understand that Molly is only a couple years younger than in this show, but Molly didn't feel like a kid prior in the prior seasons. 
But in this, she definitely feels more like the youngest, but not at the expense of making her act like a baby, you know? And I feel like that's the, like that balance they needed to reach for, to get me to actually really like Molly. Yeah. So, you know, that's really cool. And, of course, I love her, you know, specific connections to, of course, Gert, who is her older sister, and Chase, who is kind of like her brother-in-law, kind of. Yeah. And also how she she never, like, gave up on the fact that they were family. Like, in the beginning, she was the one championing for Chase to be part of the family again. Yeah, exactly. I, I love that. Molly has always been the heart of the team. She is supposed to be the heart. And Molly was I, even like Molly was even like, yeah, he was a dick, and he betrayed us, but he's family. Yeah, like you, you don't. You, it's like you don't always have to like family, but you definitely love them no matter what. Uh, and like that's Molly's job, and I'm glad like they were able to get that across finally. It's a shame it had to be in the last season, but at least they got to do it. Yeah, and I like that. Um... Molly, we got to see, like, her worst fear, finally, and that it's that her parents were actively yeah. Pride members. Yep, and they were complicit in everything that Pride did. And also, we got to see just how freaking powerful Molly is. Like, mm-hmm. so much so that everybody is after Molly just to use Molly against the other runaways. Yeah, and I love it, love it, like, right before the speech about being superheroes, that she's like, look, I'm struck by lightning, like, legit struck by lightning, and I'm fine. Yeah, she's like, check this out, I got this cool scar. Dope, right? (laughs) And I, I also love, I also feel bad for Jeff. Poor Jeff. Jeff got, like, fucking... Completely manhandled <laughs> by Molly. Yep. Man ended up with shrapnel in his freaking stomach, and he's just like, "Nah, I'm good. Sorry, it's, right. it's not your fault, Molly." Oh man. I just need some Nana Bees remedy, and I'll be fine. Molly was great, though. Um, again, yes. just she she was that hopeful heart of the team that we definitely needed. Okay, so now let's let's keep going, and we'll get to our favorites last. So let's talk about Chase. So Chase, Chase, Chase is my dude. I actually am a big fan of Greg Stolkin as an actor. Really, really mm-hmm. like him. And so I thought he would be a really good fit for Chase, and I was right. Um, you know, Chase actually gets a lot more to do in this season. He actually gets to help his dad confront his own abuser which is really cool, he, and he gets to, you know, officially break the cycle, which I thought was dope. Um, and he gets a lot, especially in this last season, he gets a lot of one-liners. And he gets a lot of cool shit. Like, that's the yeah. thing about Chase that people forget. Chase makes some cool-ass gadgets. The Fistagons. We do not get to see the frog, which I was kind of upset about. But, oh, we did get to see a drawing of the frog last season, remember? Yep. Yeah, I remember. But I'm just saying we never actually got to see it fully built. Which, but in, uh, Instead of the frog, we got a really nice old car. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so, I'll also... I'm also a big church fan. So, we got a lot of cute-ass yes. church moments. Um, definitely enjoyed the hell out of that. Um, I loved seeing just Chase's development and his own maturity and kind of adopting some of Gert's, you know, mannerisms that weren't super annoying, um, into his own, like, mentality. And it's just so great, like, especially when we get to see future Chase apply that to Gert, and Gert being, like, shook. Yeah. She's like, what the hell? Yeah. But also, even at the beginning, though, he was the first out of the three to realize that this was all a simulation, that this yep. was all not real. And one of the reasons why he knew it was because he's like, Gert wouldn't be this much of a damsel in distress. Yep. Gert's a badass. Yeah. She would never say that she needs me. 
Gert doesn't, and Gert doesn't need me. Like, yeah, <laughs> I thought that was really cool. Um, and I love that where he's just like, oh yeah, so now this happens, and then Alex is gonna come in that window right there. Bam. Yep. Yep. Um, so now let's move on to Gert. Gert, I have a weird up and down relationship with, similar to her sister Molly. The first season, Gert could not stand her. <laughs> and I can't, I couldn't stand, I couldn't stand early comic Gert either, because early, both early comic Gert and like early TV show Gert are like obnoxious new wave feminists. Mm hmm. And, like, they always have to correct people and prove they're right. And she's just, she was so freaking annoying. Uh, but eventually she toned it down. And I love that they, like, incorporated anxiety and mental health stuff with her. Mm-hmm. So well handled for season two. I thought that was phenomenal. That's the part where, that's the part of the season and the show where I really started to fall in love with Gert. I mean, of course, I loved Gert in the comics also. And, it broke my heart when what happened to her happened to her, but, you know, it was fixed in the current run right now, uh, which is funny because that's actually what happens uh, in season three. But we'll get to that. Uh, of course, you know, my, you know, the, the best part of this show is, you know, Old Lace as brought to you by Lyft. <laughs> yep. Old Lace is amazing. I love that dino. She, uh, she's the reason I picked up the comic in the first place. Uh, so, And they handle old, her so well in the show. Yep. Old Lace is really great. Uh, it, not only does the effect look good, but like the, the, you know, the dinosaur itself has a lot of personality and the actors react well to it. it it's not, it doesn't look like they're just like, you know, looking at a tennis ball, you know? Yeah. It's really well done. Love Old Lace. Love Old Lace's reactions with uh, with Dale and Stacy. They're fantastic. Um, so yeah, and I love much. and I love how Old Lace like is sexually connected to Gert, so like all of Old Lace's reactions with Chase. Yep, and I love that Gert's like, Why are you taking his side? Which actually is a very subtle nod to the fact that uh, when Gert dies in the comic books, uh, before she dies, she passes her psychic connection to Old Lace on to Chase. I thought they might do that in the show. but I thought that was going to happen too, honestly. Um, but they decided to skip over that. Uh, they might... Uh, honestly, I think they might have if they were sure that they were getting season yeah. four. Yeah, but since they knew they were getting canceled, they skipped over and got to the important part. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, that was Gert. Obviously, we're going to talk more about her death when we get to the ending and, you know, but, the, but the yeah, rescue just, mission arc. And just, like, learning all the fear about her, because we really got inside of her head this season. Especially yep. with the help of awesome guest star... Which, oh man, that broke my heart even more. Like, dang it. Especially that at the end. Yeah, we're just like, maybe you can help us next time. And I'm like, no, they can't. And neither can you. Oh man. Okay, so next up, we will talk about Alex. Okay, so really enjoyed Alex. Alex, he battled his inner darkness a lot this season, um, which I thought was really well handled. And they did a very interesting twist on the Alex is the traitor story arc by having mm-hmm. Alex be possessed by the Gib unknowingly. And then, and then they also, once you were like, okay, so he's free, he, they freed him of the the freedom of it, the the Alex is a traitor story is over. Nope. They then hurt you again by doing stuff with the other guest star and some yep. hints. 
However, uh, it's all. I, I also love that they, it's left completely ambiguous, right? Like it's never yeah. fully decided, because like obviously, like there are some hints, especially with future Alex, that Alex goes evil. But there's also hints that future Chase was not telling the whole story. Yeah. So, like and, it's thus and very that... ambiguous whether or not Alex is really evil or Alex will really turn out to be evil. Yeah, which is good, especially considering that this is the end. Mm-hmm. My only friend, the end. Uh, but yeah, so that's pretty much Alex. I think he was really well handled. Uh, again, he is the one character out of the team that I think, uh, the, at least like the main runaways, that I think was yeah. handled better than his comic version. Well, also one other thing that we have to address about Alex in this season was he was not in it for a good chunk. Yeah, because um, there there was a portion where, of course, he was possessed by Gib, and then there was a portion where he was trapped in the dark dimension. Mm-hmm. Yep. But with the screen time he got, uh, you know, he they handled him really well. Um, Indeed. And I've never also, seen that actor before, but yeah, he did a really good job. Also, fun fact, uh, IRL, uh, the actor who plays Alex, is actually dating uh, the actress who plays Gertz, IRL best friend, the actress who plays Elena in One Day at a Time. Really? Yeah. So, nice little six degrees. Yep. And you think maybe since his show is done, maybe he could come over? Not as and, a love interest. And... And Gert's show is done too, so maybe Carmen will come back. I, look, we'll, we'll we'll save that for the one day at a time podcast, which you know is coming. But but, but you know what would be funny though? What? What if they came on as a couple? <laughs> oh, that would be great. That would be great. That would be so great. Because, like, you know, j- just a little, little little one day at a time tangent. If you guys want to picture, uh, is a uh, if you guys want to picture. Uh, Gert's character on One Day at a Time. Imagine if Gert was Nico. <laughs> yeah. And that is Carmen. Uh, her character minus her magic. Yeah, minus magic. Although we don't know. It's not confirmed. So <laughs> let's, let's, let's leave a question mark by that. Well, she did go to California at the end. Yeah. So question mark. We'll address that in the One Day at a Time podcast. Uh, but anyway, uh, next runaway, we are finally getting into the meat and potatoes, the ones that like I really, really want to talk about. Let's talk about Carolina, which will also let us talk about Zavin. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. So, Carolina. Sweet Carolina. Ba, ba, ba. Thank you, Brian. I'm glad you get me. Uh, yeah, but in case a spoiler alert for Channel Chasers, we do like thing and music stuff a lot. A lot. <laughs> Just wait for the HSMTMGS episode. If that happens, you know there's going to be a lot of singing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, uh, so. Carolina is one of my favorite characters of all time. She, her journey was so well done. And it's one of the first big coming out stories Mar- Marvel ever did. Keep in mind, Runaway started in like 2004. So it's pretty huge. Yep. And... Um... Okay, you go. You oh no! Finish. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! My bad. Okay, uh, edit point, please. <laughs> so, uh, Carolina, she. What the reason why I like her a lot is because they don't follow normal gay character conventions with her in both the comics and the TV show. It's not like you know, she's not promiscuous. She's very innocent and sweet, and it's really just kind of her figuring herself out. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being promiscuous, you know. If that's what you want to do, you do you. But, like, I'm glad they don't do that with her. 
because it's a stereotype that I'm kind of annoyed with. Especially the fact that it's 2019 and, like, we actually know, like, realistically how gay people are. Mm-hmm. You know? So, I'm, I'm very happy about that. And Nico and Carolina's relationship has was never, like... And Gert would be proud of me for using this one. It was never kind of filtered through the male gaze kind of thing. Like, they never, like, just had them blatantly making out or having sex unless, like, it was, like, a a, a really sweet moment prior to that. Every kiss that they had was tender, sweet, and just really heartwarming. And their relationship felt organic. Yeah, they fell in love by the end of season one, but you understood why they fell in love, and they fell in love so strongly. Yeah, I mean, a a good chunk of their PDA is not on camera. It's alluded to. Yep. Really like, appreciate I, I that. I love that in like season two, where it's just like, you see the shine come from the room, so you just know that they're... Yep. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder, so, like, I don't want to get super crude or anything, but I wonder if, and, you know, you'll get this if you've seen The Boys, I wonder if Carolina is, like, a Starlight situation. Well, I mean, she already is glowing when it that's starts. What that's what I'm, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, like, is, is, is it that kind of thing? Like, these are the I, questions that we ask. I almost... I almost wonder if it's kind of like, um, this is an even deeper cut for you, but like, uh, when this type of stuff happens on, uh, Team Four Star. Yeah, exactly. Dragon Ball Z, where it's just like, release the energy as you release the energy. Exactly. These are the hard hitting questions you will only get here on the Channel Chasers podcast. Hard hitting on purpose. Phrasing. Boom. But anyway, um, but yeah, so yeah, um, yeah, Caroline, and I also just love the whole like exploration of religion through Carolina's character as well. Like mm-hmm. in the uh, in the comics, actually, like this is a completely show original. In the comics, the deans were just movie stars, and Carolina's whole arc was that she was this vapid, like valley girl stereotype, and then you find out that there's so much deeper to her and it's kind of the same way with this one like she's just your she's like a pretty church girl that is like the face of her you know parents mega church so people underestimate her and think she's a certain type of way but she's not uh but i actually i think the religious aspect adds a lot more depth and uh it, it, it lets you explore a lot more interesting like concepts and ideas mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying Especially when we get into, like, again, the flashback territory and the stuff with Leslie and just a lot of the darker stuff that's in, involved with that. Mm-hmm. If I, I mean, be... anyone familiar with religion, like, religion is a pretty dark subject beyond if I'm be... the surface. If I'm being honest with you, uh, Carolina on the show... Thank you for using. Thank you for using the story. Thank you for using the correct pronunciation. By the way, I appreciate it. Because I didn't have any backstory. Uh, she was a, definitely a slow burn character for me. Like she was a little too high and mighty when it started for my taste. But then when you like start to get her and start to like go underneath the surface and all that. I really like. I really started to like her, and she grew more and more as the show goes. And it's just like, yeah, um, like now you now you understand why I like love her with such a passion because like I I know that journey and I I've been here, you know. She's a precious little star child, literally. She really intuitively. is. She really is, and I, like you you gotta protect her at all costs. She is like, she she's like a rainbow baby Yoda, like. Must protect. Um, but, you know, moving from dar- uh, light to darkness, let's talk about my absolute favorite character. Well, I oh, feel yeah. like, I feel like just one thing. 
mm-hmm. uh, as a way to transition. All right. Because we never really talked about this. Um, Opening on the big feels punch, her ultimate dream. Yeah, man! Oh, dude! So, I ha- so fun fact, you guys. So, a lot of times when we're watching these shows in preparation for the podcast, um, like, Ryan and I will, like, text back and forth as we're watching, like, you know, just sharing our feels and stuff. So, we can get a kind of a feel for, like, how the conversation's gonna go in episodes without having to, like, write notes or a script. We kind of just look back at our text messages. And... I had the same exact reaction Brian did when he started. I was like, really? Y'all are starting with this? You're starting with this? Why? Mm -hmm. My heart. I can't take it. Why are you hurting my baby? Don't do it. Mm Mm-hmm. And then then evil Stacy comes in and is just like, oh, yeah, this is all a dream. Screw you. Bye. Oh, man. But, yeah. Okay. So now, moving from light to darkness, let's talk about my favorite character on this entire team, both in comics and in show. Mostly, and I think she is the reason I have a huge, huge, huge thing for goth girls. This is, she is the reason. Nico Minoru. Sister Grimm, my goodness, this character. Where do I even begin, man? Um, so, Nico has probably the most character development out of any character in the teen cast. She starts off as a complete loner who shuts herself off. They, they hint a lot at the self-harm that she inflicts. Because of her depression, um, you know, Gert, obviously, they handle a lot of mental health stuff, but they do the same with Nico as well. And with her stuff, they handle with just as much care. They also handle, like, trauma and, uh, like, survivor's guilt type stuff. And plus, she has magic, and I love magic. So it's really cool. And plus, like, her spellcast system is really interesting. So, you know, for those of you guys who are unaware, I mean, you, you know if you've seen the show and you're in the spoiler section, so I'm assuming you've seen the show. But the way Nigo's spells work are she cannot use the same spell twice. So what Nigo does to supplement this is she literally has to study the dictionary and learn several different languages. Um, which is what she does when she goes to train with Doctor Strange. Which is actually mentioned by future Nico. Mm-hmm. Which, which, is, which is funny, though, because in the Doctor Strange movie, we actually get to see... Uh, Tina Minoru, but it's a different actress. Yep. Yeah, so... Uh, I think the really... official canon, though, is that they're sisters or something. Yep. yep. Yeah, because Nico does have an aunt. Uh, but, yeah, it, it's really well done. Um, very similar to Alex, um, Nico has a battle with her inner darkness, which is why I think Alex and Nico's friendship is super important. Because I think they get each other the most. And I do like the fact that they started and you were like, are they doing a romance between the two? And it got to be kind of like that. But then that spurt spurted when Denoru came around and there wasn't, there was a little bit of awkwardness, yeah. but... And I, and I I love that they don't go with the trope, and I love that Alex is like, all I really wanted was to make you happy. And, you know, I guess I in, in, inadvertently led to that, so I'm glad. Mm-hmm. And that's why, like, you know, when Alex does go dark, Nico understands it, and it's like, look, man, I can keep you safe in a happy place to make sure you're okay. 
I'll, I'll either I'll, I can make it look I can make it feel like Hawaii or Fiji, which is a nice nod to Shield, or even that nice Star Wars hotel. I would take the Star Wars hotel. Mm-hmm. Even Evil Out said take the Star Wars hotel. So yeah, I, I really like their friendship. It's really well done. I loved her relationship with her mother. Um, it's one of the more complicated of. You mm-hmm. know, all the parent-child relationships. Um, and, man, like, you want to talk about good back and forth, watch any back and forth between Tina and Nico. It is amazing. hmm And also, like, not many people can stand up to Elizabeth Hurley, but Nico, damn sure, could stand up to Elizabeth Hurley. I mean, Damn. Yeah, like whoa. in more ways than one. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's transition into that. Let's talk about the parents, but I want to open up by talking about Elizabeth Hurley. And so, this is my obligatory perv moment for the podcast. Uh, this is, the, these will happen quite often, but like, can we just pause for a second? Holy shit! How is she still so fucking hot? How is she 54? And still so fucking hot. Indeed. Like, she is a serious, just fine wine. Not a not mm-hmm. a snack, not a full course meal. She is a fine wine. She gets better with age. Like, holy shit. She, she looks better here than she did in her, like, short time in Austin Powers. No, you want to talk about her in her prime. What that was that god, devil movie? Th- that yeah, god awful movie? movie, Bedazzled. Is that the devil movie? Yes. Yeah, I love that one. Where she's like wearing like oh, leather and I, all I, that. I, yeah, no, I, I, I remember. I remember that 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 that, that has had that had specific effects on me as um, you know, a young man growing but, up. And I imagine, too, because your religion and she's the literal devil. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of guilt was had. Um, I, I, I do got to admit, though, that um, she is probably the sexiest devil. Only uh, sex- Tom Ellis! Uh, Tom Ellis, I, I feel like Tom Ellis tops that. Huh. Well, I was going to have him as a close second, honestly. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. But for my heteronormative views. I mean, I'm I'm straight too, but I got I, I gotta acknowledge that like Tom Ellis is just Indeed. a freaking charismatic, handsome ass dude. Like mm. well we'll get to, we'll have a looser for episode eventually and I'll talk about that in more yep. detail. But, Indeed. I mean, all the beautiful people on that show. Oh but. my goodness, right? Uh, but, I mean, but back to beautiful people. Le- Morgan Le Fay, man. Whew. When they first announced that Morgan Le Fay was going to be a part of the show, I was like, what? What the? F- what yeah, the f- well, how is this going to work? And who are they going to get to play? Oh my god, they got Elizabeth Hurley? What? And then... And the interesting thing is, though, is from what little I know about the comics, she sort of took the place of Nico's grandmother. Yep. While they still hinted at Nico's grandmother. Yeah, Nico's grandmother was still in it. But yeah, Nico's grandmother is supposed to be the dark witch that tries to, like, actually. She kind of. If you've seen Naruto, she based. Or if you've seen Naruto or, like, uh,. I, I don't know any other examples, but, like, she wanted, uh, the comic story has her wanting to, like, basically take Nico's body so that she can be more youthful and, you know, the standard stuff. Um, but, and, and you know, uh, Morgan does kind of do that. I mean, she doesn't completely transfer her essence to Nico, but she does take her over at a point. Um, so that's cool. Um, it was, it For was, it was an a, orgy? It was a, it was a very like Sith type of dynamic. Yeah, there was the witch orgy. As it, you do. It, it was weird though, because the way that they ran things, 
and her coven and all that was kind of like if you mixed Sith with the uh, way they do Matt, which is on um, Sabrina, the reboot. Yep. Yep, so. I could definitely see that. I was actually going to bring up a more obscure show that uh, I know you watched, but, I, uh, you know, points to any viewer that actually watched this show because I feel like it was an underrated gem. Um, yeah. Witches, of e- Witches of East End. Yes, indeed. It reminded me a lot of that. Starring Alice Cooper from... Yo, yo, as a sexy, shape-shifting cat. Like, yep. That's, let, me just, let me just repeat that. Like, we got the chick from Twin Peaks, whose name I cannot even try to pronounce, because I know I'm going to get it wrong, uh, who plays Alice Cooper on Riverdale. She is the, you know, quote-unquote slutty aunt who uh, is cursed to uh, transform into a cat, and whenever she transforms back into her human form, of course she's not wearing any clothes because she's a cat. Meow. Right? But, but yeah, um, just quick side note, though, because that made me think of, like, because Lucy's in that show. Mm-hmm. Um, Lucy Lane, I mean. Yep. Jenna. Uh, Jenna, Jenna DeWan Tatum. For those of you guys who don't, who didn't watch the first season of Superhero, back back when that was still going on, I thought that her sister from Witches could have been a good Lois. Yeah, that's pretty one. solid. Yeah, I can see that. Um, but back to but back to Morgan. Um, I really liked her plan. I loved that like technology and magic were so well incorporated. And it definitely felt like a, a, it was a pretty solid plan. I mean, using smartphones to take over the masses. I mean, we're all pretty addicted to, their, to our phones. I mean, hell, I'm recording this podcast from my phone right now. True day. True day. Um, and I've recently been getting into TikTok, which is only on the phone. Yep. So, you know, uh, it, it's definitely a solid plan. It was, and it was pretty well executed. I mean, so much so that we had to, like, do some time travel shenanigans later. Um, well, and also had to get help from two special warriors. All right. So w- once we get through the pride section, we gotta, we ha- we're going to have a whole section on those two. Uh, Don't worry about it, guys. Um, okay. But, yeah. So uh, let's quickly address the pride so we can talk about those two. Um, so uh, Robert... He, I feel like he got a good send off, and he got to play mm-hmm. a pivotal role in the defeat of Morgana or Morgan, which is which, cool. And I and I love that where he's like, "See the world through my eyes." Yeah, I knew exactly what he was doing. I was like, "Oh shit!" He recorded it on his Google glasses or wizard that's, glasses. That's nice. That was a nice touch. There. And 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 I love I love that both of both Nico and the mom were like Robert, you brilliant son of a bitch. Yep. <laughs> that was so good. Um, so he got a good send off. Um, so I'm gonna quickly address this because there isn't really much to say. But fuck Catherine. Yeah. Which kind of sucks because I really like that actress. Uh, she's she, fun fact. She was on Lab Rats as the mom. Oh, yeah. That's actually where I remember her from. Fuck. Yeah, right? Damn, she is such... The range. Am I right? Like, the range. Indeed. So good. Uh, But also, fuck Catherine. Uh... I mean, you start to feel a little sympathy towards her, especially when she, like, sacrificed herself, but she was still not doing it for the right reasons. And still being and, she, a- and, she, and, she, and she wanted to turn Alex into a bad guy. It's like, she was purposely like, all right, no, I respect you for doing what you did. Because you're just like me. And I'm just like, no, Catherine. You should be saying, don't be like me. Because Catherine's thing was that she wanted to get her family back together at any cost. Yep. 
Which I know which, it's gonna sound kind of bad, but kind of glad they killed her off. Yeah, same. Jeffrey's better off with Tamara, to be honest. If mm-hmm. I'm, if I'm, you know, really telling the truth, because. I mean, Darius was a good husband to her, and I feel like, you know, he was a good dude, despite, you know, his shady past as well. But I'm kind of glad. Whoa. I just realized. Darius and Catherine were a lot alike. Very similar. Um, but speaking of Catherine, let's transition to Jeffrey. Again, ha- so happy Jeffrey got to redeem himself. So happy that Jeffrey got to finally realized his dream of helping his community and fi- really giving back to the you know where he get, oh, you know where he got his start um, and, that, loved, and I loved, loved all that and I love that his like big moment of triumph is uh oh oh we need to get pride together to save Molly finally yep. do some good to the pride name yep and also I'm really happy that he was like uh you know, uh, when he when things were when things were going wrong and like Alex is going towards the dark side and he was all injured, he was like, "Look, man, you think you're hard, but this is not the path you need to go on, dude." Like, I've seen I've seen people go down this route and they just don't come back. I don't want to see you turn into me. A sad thing is though is uh, after that he like gave Alex a couple glances and I feel like that would have been further explored in a possible another season but with what we were given I did really like him because mm-hmm. when he comes on he, in the first season you just think of him as like the gangster who made it who's yeah he's basically like if you've seen power and I know you haven't Brian but like this is just for the audience if you, in case they have seen it He's basically like Ghost from Power, you know? He's a corner boy who ended up, you know, making it, and, like, he's got a legit business now, and he's rich. Mm Mm-hmm. So, yeah, again, there's a lot more depth added to him, which I thought was really nice. So now, let's... And I like how he was like, crap, I've got nowhere else to turn to. Tamar? Yep. So, uh, we already kind of talked about Janet, so we don't really need to spend too much time on her, but now we can go into more detail. We we Um, do need to talk about, like, her final destination and all that. Yeah. I love, I love that, you know, she was the one who was instrumental in, like, getting them to get out of the simulation, and then in the end, she goes from being Janet Stein to essentially Janet from the good place. Mm Mm-hmm. But, like, a cyber version. Mm Mm-hmm. Which I thought was awesome. And I, I love when, like, uh, you know, we can stop beating around the bush. I love when Ty is like, does that Siri have a face? Mm-hmm. And yeah. It's like, that's not, that's not Siri, that's Janet? It's like, oh, hey, guys. <laughs> and I'm it's just like, she's like, eh, I like being a computer. I'm good. She's like, this is the happiest I've been in a long time. I'm cool. Like she, she's she's taking everything in stride. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and and the cool thing is, is even after she became a a uh, she she kind of similar to what I'm seeing from later seasons of Janet. She had a little pep in her step and. Very yeah, much had a personality. She, yeah, she, she still, like, yeah, she still, she still had her own. Yeah, she still had her own personality still in there. And it kind of reminds me of like whenever in the comics Tony converts his consciousness into an AI. Yeah, it's very similar to that. Because I, because I like that they're like, crap, we need, we need a virus. And it's just like, and she's like, you're talking to one. I am a virus. Love that. Um, yeah. And so, and that, and like that moment where she was flirting with Victor about their like dark side moment. Yep, and their also rebellious youth. And also like the sweet moment where she, uh, where he, uh, where Chase is like, "Well, mom, are you okay about this?" She goes, "Yeah, well, other than the fact that I can't hug you two right now, I'm cool." Yeah, 
Yeah. And and I love how um, Victor, like, he, like, kisses his hand and touches the screen, like... Yeah, that's so cute. And he's like, Janet, you beautiful. Yep. I, I, that was really cute. So now let's talk about Victor. Victor has a huge improvement as well, um, as do all the Pride parents. Um, but, you know, once Victor realizes how much of a dick he's been and, like, kind of where it stems from, mm-hmm. he feels horrible. Um, and, like, he really does go above and beyond to make up for it. Because basically what happens with Victor, that because you would think, like, what would it take to shock an abusive asshole like him Mm -hmm. try being possessed by an evil an evil like king alien and then leader and then once once you think after spending like years it seems like a year of being trapped in your own body then when you're finally freed you're forced to live out your own nightmare for like and also you months. gotta think about an you also gotta think about an extra layer with Victor. Victor was trapped in his body in multiple ways uh, throughout the show because like in the first season, he's trapped in his body because the only reason he's helping Jonah is so that Jonah can cure his cancer. yeah so like Victor has a lot going on, man um indeed. But just to see him where he's kind of like... Victor, in the end, is kind of what I would imagine a hybrid of Olicity would be. Yeah. Victor Victor and Chase have some of the best parent-child team-ups. Indeed. Um, they're, they're, those are some of my favorite parent-child moments, is Victor and Chase. Because Chase is... Uh, because. Uh, Victor's just like, well, damn, kids, you're pretty fucking smart. He mm-hmm. goes, yeah, well, I am your son. And he's he like, goes, damn you right, get you all are. that from me. And, but he's like, damn right you are, but, you know, you didn't get it all from me. I love that. It's really good. Good stuff. Um, yeah, and also I like it where, uh, where Victor and Janet are starting to, like, reconnect, and they're talking about, like, their rebellious youth, and they're starting to flirt with each other. And he's just like, Chase is like, I'm gonna go leave. Yep, he's just like, ah, uh, you two clearly need a moment. Uh, <laughs> uh so, alright, now, uh, which pride parent is next? Uh, Tina? well. Or, oh, no, 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 let's, let's go to Stacy. Let's go to Stacy, because Victor and Stacy are kind of involved in a couple, yeah. a couple different ways. So, Stacy ends up, Stacy ends up getting possessed by the mother magistrate. Uh, which is, of course, Jonah's wife. And so, I love this because Dale, Dale's reaction is priceless. So, you know, after Stacy gets uh, back in her own body, she explains to Dale, and she goes, well, um, so, honey, uh, while I was possessed, while Victor and I were possessed, they, you know, used our bodies to engage in a little... Relief. So, yeah. uh, and I love Dale. He goes, Victor, not cool, bro. Yeah. Yeah. He goes, he goes, I understand the whole trying to kill me thing and being, you know, homicidal due to your possession and all that. And even trying to kill our daughters. But you got kinky with Victor? Victor? Not cool, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and I love... And I'm, but yes. Yeah, he, goes, we are, he goes, we are, we are going straight to couples counseling twice a week. And she goes, maybe make that three times. And he's like, yeah, three times. <laughs> it's just... This is so... And it's, and it's just like, she played evil so good, but it hurt so much. Yeah. Right? And also, like, Stacy has her own kind of little tiny bits of evil. Uh, like, when you see, like, her worst fear and, like, her mind-wiping Gert and how fucked up that is and how that, you know, actually is heavily implied and, like, outright said to be the cause of Kurt's anxiety. At least the origins. Yeah. 
because it was her like not knowing her own memories and being mm-hmm. anxious about that. Yep. But it's just like and it's just to see like Stacy so wrapped up in it. And also you you caught something like smooth about that situation. Yeah. Uh, Stacy's so smart that she knew that they were in a loop. But she didn't care. Yeah. I, I thought that was great. Like she actively knew uh, that it was in a loop, but she still played along. Mm-hmm. Uh, so next, oh, we already talked about Dale a lot. I love I, Dale's just kind of downward yeah. spiral. It's I, absolutely hilarious. The I kids love, in the shelter call him Dale to fail. Yes, and I and I love that he tried that. It that he realizes like what he did at the end of season two was really wrong. Yep. And but then instead of facing his fears and his wife, he kid. He kidnaps his daughter and runs away. But then after that, even when the daughter talks to him, it's just like, he decides to go off-grid, and his off-grid led him to just like a block away from the church. (laughs) Eventually. After eating like some bad berries. Yeah, which causes a rash. And trying to sterilize the bad battery, it berries with his... Yeah, with his pee. Yep, and he's just like the little like science and he's just like crazy and he, and yeah, and he's, just, and he's just like note to self: raccoons become aggressive when they detect the scent of human urine. <laughs> and he's just like his sciencey little monologues that he did. He's just and he's just so fucking weird. I think that's what Dale and Stacy were both so fucking weird. That that's what made them great. Yeah, because because uh, we didn't mention this, I forgot to, but. Once Dick, once uh, Stacy and Victor get back into their own bodies, and have like trauma of what they went through, Stacy's first reaction is to go to a go a to support an alien group. abduction support group. I, I I love that scene because Victor straight up tells the whole story, and they're like, "I don't like that you're making fun of us." And Victor's like, "What the but, fuck? That's actually what happened to me." But then also taking it one step further, they were like, raise your hand who's feeling patronized by Victor and Stacy <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love Stacy and Victor's friendship post-possession. It's so funny. Yeah, because I, I love it, though, because he's like, well, um, I know things are awkward, but you want to help me with this project? And she and I, I, I love when like she suggests the whole thing about the support group, and he makes fun of it. He goes, "I hate being in this room full of screwballs." And he goes, "Just to be clear, I am including you in the category of screwball." Mm-hmm. And she goes, I, "I, I kind of figured as much." Like she, like he is the perfect straight man to her like weird quirky comedy, and it is hilarious. Yeah, but. It's also hilarious when you just get the two cork balls together. Because yeah. I love it when they're trying to save Molly and they're like, we need a distraction to keep everyone in the room. They on stage just look at each other and they're like, yeah, we got this. And then they, yep, and they, 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 they yeah, the yeah. CDC. And they're, they're like talking, to, they're like giving them all the symptoms and stuff. Have you checked your stool lately? It's hilarious. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now let's uh, quickly talk about Tina because Tina's pretty important. She has a pivotal role with the fight against Morgana. Um, we Which find was out, really cool. Yeah, we find out they have history, and Tina. It's implied that Tina was the one who sealed her away, or uh, you know, in the first place. So that's really cool. But also, T- also, um, Tina was the original. Nico, where she tried to manipulate her through yep. the veil. Yep. And then also, um, like, you know, I, I love that, like, Morgan tries to steal Robert from uh, Tina, and Tina's reaction is, hey, guess what, bitch? <laughs> Janet Stein tried to do this, and it didn't work. And so, then, fuck you. And then when she does realize why he's so into her and all that, 
Well, first she gives him like a heartfelt speech, which is like, damn, you've always been to your about your family. You know, like, damn. And then she looks and sees that he's got the little charm. Mm-hmm. And then her first reaction is just to go, like, yep. Hit him. She's like, she's, full, yeah, she's very open. She's palm, very efficient. Hit him in the chest. Yep. She's very efficient. I, lo- I like her. She's very no nonsense. Yes. Um, all right. So I feel like we've addressed every pride parent. So now it gets the fun part. But oh. just oh, one last thing about Tina, though, mm-hmm. is I love how she, like, ended up teaching Nico some stuff. And it's like seeing her with and Nico interact. They have like, some of the most she... badass parent and child moments, like where like, Chase and Victor have some of the most fun. Uh, Nico and Tina have some of the most badass. But they do have their own fun moments. Like Nico's like, I can say more than one word. Yep, we were all we were all novice ones, Nico. It's not your fault. <laughs> but but yeah, it's just Tina using all the magic and stuff, and then her opening her like cloak, keeping the bad ghouls at bay from the dark realm, and then her finally sealing her away. Which you know is something, which I just realized. Oh yeah. Tina's magic is when they show it without the staff and all. It's she's got very, the circles, yeah, yeah, circular. Yeah, she's got the she's got the Doctor Strange thing because I mean you see the witches uh, in um, Morgan's Coven also do the circular like hand like the hand casty spells that we see in Doctor Strange, which is a nice tie-in. Indeed, and it and it's nice. Um, but yeah, she Tina. She started off as like the head evil bitch, and then like she, right, be- she only only uh, only to be topped by like Leslie, who was like the top top bitch. And then, and then uh, they both got redeemed. Mm-hmm. Uh, partly, uh, partly, part of it is because of. Um, because of um, Leslie having another baby, which, by the way, we never we said we were going to, but we never talked about Zavin. Oh yeah, the, the, I was that, that's actually the perfect transition because I was, I was about to transition into Zavin. Oh, I uh, thought you were going to talk about the other. Uh, oh yeah, no, I was gonna I was gonna Zavin first because uh, I, I realized that we didn't get to talk about her. So yeah, let's talk about Zavin. So I love Zavin's character because I mean, in the comics, she's kind of the, like. The, um, you know, Carolina's first serious girlfriend, and she was the major. She's the major stepping stone um, for Carolina to fully realize that she was gay. Because you know, fun fact: Zavin first shows up in male form in the comics, and then we find out that they are a shapeshifter, and so they turn into they take a female form um, because they love Carolina, and they so if this is the you know if this is what Carolina wants. This is how they'll be. Um, and so Which, it's a really sweet relationship. Um, also, fun fact for you guys that might not know if you don't know the comics. Zavin is a scroll. Yep. And, the she is, and she is the first. Uh, she's one of the first. Uh, I would consider either. I mean, and forgive me if I like mislabel this, uh, you know, LGBT community but she's the first like non-binary slash like trans technically trans character uh, i mean wouldn't it wouldn't the technical term be gender fluid oh well, yeah that also works uh she's literally gender fluid um or yeah her, her preferred pronoun is she um but huh. yeah so she's okay. she's uh, so i would consider i would consider her more trans um because you know the, uh, they mostly use the she pronoun at first, like you know, they're like they refer to Zavin as he and stuff. But then when like she when she switches over to like her from then on default form, they just you know she. So I would consider her trans, but again, she's an alien, so it's a weird it's a weird semantics game. Um, Indeed. But uh, yeah, Zavin's great. I love they masterfully step over the love triangle. 
they sidestep it so well using the baby. And I love that they hint at it and that... You know, they it, they, they poke at it a couple times. And I love that, that, Zavin, that Zavin, her character is just like, yes, this is going to be a love triangle. I'm going to you... not stop until it's a love triangle. And Caroline is like, no... Nah, no. I'm in love. I'm in love with Nico. I'm not budging. I, 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 I think you're cool, but I don't like you. Not like, at least not like that. And she's like, "Do you even like me like that?" She's like, "I have to to save my people." Yep. And uh, but one, or like one, uh, unexpected friendships. Probably my favorite friendship of this mm-hmm. season is Zavin and Molly. You mean X and Molly? Yeah, X and Molly. Oh, oh, okay. So I didn't, I didn't realize this, but like their friendship is a drug. Re- it's kind of a drug reference. <laughs> <laughs> like when you when you said it out loud, the first thing I thought of was, "Holy crap!" Wait. Well, the reason why I said that was because Molly. Yeah, called Mo- her ex. Yeah, yeah, I I understand, but like that clicked in my head as soon as you said it out loud. But but yeah, it's 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 hola- It's one of the most hilarious, adorable friendships on the show. Uh, it, it's kind of like it's kind of like the the trope of the two novices working together and learning through each other type trope. Yeah. Exactly, and I, I, th- my favorite scene is when like Zavin tries to drive and they almost, ki- you know, they almost die, and Molly's like, "Nah, screw this, you're gonna get us killed. Let me drive." And also, I love it when Zavin is like trying to give this speech to Molly, and it actually works. But at the end, she's like, "I believe this is where they extend their," and yep. like gives the sciencey thing for hugging. Yep, and then yep. to see. Zavin's like stiff trying to hug. Yep. I love that. Love that. And I, I love that like the, it turns out the love that, you know, Zavin was looking for was actually the like the love of the child. This is a very frozen type of, you know, thing. I was about I to it. bring that up. Love yeah. that. Indeed. And honestly, I know that we're not gonna get it because we're not gonna even get a season four. But mm-hmm. I would love to see like a spinoff of Zav of a slightly older Zavin and a kid. You know what? You know, fun fact. Fun fact. We don't actually know what happened to Zavin in the comics. So, um, you know, just a little comic history. Last time we saw Zavin, Zavin shapeshifted into Carolina when the magistrates wanted to take Carolina and marry her off uh, so that they could, you know, bring peace between the scrolls and the magistrates um, or magisterium. Uh, and so, you know, Zavin turned into Carolina. We never saw Carolina, uh, Zavin after that. Uh, I, no, I, wrote, I wrote a whole fan fiction story arc where we rescue Zavin and we find out what happened to her, but, you know, that's just fan fiction. Yeah. And like the show, that kind of ended all too soon. Yeah. But I understand. You had to wrap it up. Uh, they did the best they could with what they had. Uh, but but yeah, it's just like seeing this version of Zavin raising a little warrior who's kind. Yeah. That would be ca- kind of yeah, cool. I, I like maybe a McKenzie so Davis type character. <laughs> yep. I think that would be kind of fun. Definitely. Uh, Indeed. So now let's talk about the two special guests, Ty and Tandy from one of our personal favorite Marvel shows that both of us covered on our YouTube channels back when I had a YouTube channel at least. And we um, both and we both did channel chasers for Yeah, we did channel chasers for both seasons. Unfortunately, you can't see those anymore because my YouTube channel is shut down. I'm not bitter or anything, YouTube. Uh Baka. anyway. Anyways, uh, Ty and Tandy were fantastic, and it just made me so sad. It made me so sad. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved uh, the, the Gert 
Chase Ty friendship. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, and it's just like Ty accidentally singing. Yeah, Gert's fears. And also, I love that, you know, Ty and Chase bro out over sports. Which, you know, that's very interesting because um, Ty and Tandy are definitely romantically. Yeah, they they never they never fully say it because they only refer to uh, like they only refer to each other as friends here. But it's heavily implied that they were going but, to get together in the next season. But yeah, it's just like, and then you look and you see that the characters that they're most closely like are Nico and Chase. Yep, which is very true. Like, uh, and I, I love that. Uh, it's, it's really, Which, it's a re- <laughs> really good dynamic. And I love that, Tandy and Nico's like friendship too. It's one of the best. It's like, uh, I distrust you. I distrust you. Yeah, it, it's it's because they see so much of themselves in each other, and they both kind of have a self hatred thing. Yeah. And so. They're just like, I don't like you. I don't know why, but I don't like you. And then the other the other person in the group is like, I know why, because you guys are very similar. Yeah, which um I will admit that that episode though I have two downsides well, three downsides, but one is beyond their control. The fact that they hint at the runaways coming on to cloak and dagger, which will never happen. But then also yep. The fact that um, that dark dagger thing just... Was never used. It was used. I mean, it was used briefly. Nico used it to stab... Yeah, Mor- yeah Morgan. Yeah. But then she just absorbed it and was like... Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. She's like, no, nah, it didn't work. You thought that was going to work? Nope. Not really. And then also the other thing is... Um, Chase and Ty are so similar... I would have loved to have seen Molly's interaction with Ty. Yeah, right? Because Molly was not in that episode at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, uh, I loved what we got with them, and I, I loved Ty. My favorite thing about it was Ty's reaction to Old Lace. She was like, wait a second, that was a real dinosaur? He goes, oh, that is really fucking cool. Yeah. And it's just like their reactions to like, oh yeah, so I've got these awesome fist of guns. Which that, aren't here right now. And I'm psychically connected to a dinosaur. Which is also is not, here. not here. And it's like, well, hey, at least we've got her. It's just like, oh, my, my, my powers don't work in this dimension. It's like, great. But also... Can I just point out how smooth they integrated them and how they right? easily explained it? Yeah, and also I, I like that it shows like that Ty and Tandy have been really working on their powers in the interim because Ty is able to clear teleport across the country. Mm-hmm. But I, I love that though when he when they're rescuing the parents and it's just like take them anywhere. Yeah, and he's like, I anywhere, don't know any, anywhere in L.A. And he goes, I don't know anything about this city. He's just like, think of somewhere in L.A. And then he takes them to the Hollywood sign. And then just leaves them there tied up. And I, and, and I love Dale and Stacy. They're like, wow, the kids' new friends seem really nice. Because, <laughs> yep. of course, Dale and Stacy. And I love Dale. He goes, are you going to at least untie us? Nope, he's gone. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I love that. Um, it it's re- it's really funny. Um, again, they they are they're like they are so well integrated into it. Honestly, like even if like Cloak and Dagger was canceled, I was kind of hoping like because Cloak and Dagger was the cancellation was announced first. I was like, well, at least you know if their cameo and Runaways does well, they could just fold them in. Nope. Runaways canceled too. Yep. Now oh, well. Marvel Marvel Television is canceled altogether. Yep. Uh so yeah, um sad, but you know, I'm I'm glad they at least but, had one last hurrah, you know? And I do gotta admit that one of the uh, my opinion, 
one of the most badass moments in all of the show it was actually a moment that kind of reminded me of a Fast and Furious movie. Oh, yeah? And that was when they jumped from building to building. Oh, yeah, that was cool. Um, where, so... where Nico was like, you gotta trust me. And they yep. they ran. Carolina, Tandy, and Nico just ran on that cloud, that like dark Nimbus cloud. Yep. <laughs> it's just like, meanwhile, she's screaming and it's like this badass moment. Uh, so now we're going to transition into the time travel arc, which is, you know, how we're going to wind it down. Because um, mm-hmm. it was the last part of the season. Uh, so, first thing, I love how salty Alex is when this arc starts and Future Chase shows up. And he goes, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Out of everyone, everyone, you're the one who gets to become a fucking Time Lord? And then Nico's like, let me guess, Doctor Who. Which, holy sh- Holy shit. I just realized something. Oh, yeah? I'm wearing a Doctor Who t-shirt. You can't see it, but I'm wearing one. Nice. And also, that, that was the password that Gert gave for Alex's computer, which was wrong. Yeah. Um... So, this time travel arc was wild, man. They interacted with their pad selves. Nico got to give herself a reality check. Um, Chase got to knock himself out. There was a really cute moment with Passenger with Chase. Uh, loved all mm-hmm. of that stuff. Uh, and again, Mo- all, all Poor Molly. That. Molly with the Gert and all that. Yep. And all the hints at Alex's darkness, which we already touched on. I really like this arc. I think that was a really good way to end it. Like, it could have, I mean, it was a little messy, but they cleaned it up pretty well with by killing Future Chase. Um, and they brought it back to the first episode. Yep. So also, it, was a really, it was a real full circle moment. Also, full circle, they brought it back to another moment in the first season. And that's uh, Victor. Remember his failed college project? Yep. He tried to go back to? Yep. You remember what? Remember what that was? It was time travel. Yep. Yeah, I remember. And it's just it's so cool and interesting and And and, also... and the cool the cool thing about this is that the time travel thing isn't just coming out of left field. In season no. one, Chase Future Trace creates a device, a radio, to warn Victor about the Gibbs, you know? Yeah. And Jonah. So Future Chase has been like been active in this in the show for a while. Yeah, no, and I don't like it though because he's kind of he looks kind of like Hobo Rip Hunter. Yeah, definitely. Uh, really enjoyed, really enjoyed Chase, uh, Future Chase. Um, yeah, and and I love that moment where it's just like he sacri- he kind of sacrifices himself. Morgan kills him, and then everybody's all sad, like, Chase, no! And then Chase yeah, walks yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, you guys Chase. are not going to believe yeah. it. I was knocked out by myself. Wait, did we win? High five! And he, he high fives his dad. <laughs> Looks like we and won. the dad's like, what the f-? And then uh, pa- uh, present Nico is like, time travel. It's like, oh, which I gotta. So th- much crazy shit has happened to them. I'm pretty sure time travel is just kind of like, oh, all right, that makes sense. Well, because earlier Nico talks to her, yeah, passes up, and she's like, time travel, and Nico's just like, oh, yep. Okay. Guess this is the thing now. <laughs> but, but yeah, and I gotta tell you, I I will openly admit. That um, that when they were playing that music, and it's just like they were like, "We're gonna not exist anymore," but we saved Gert, and just they were talking about that, and then my realization that this is the end, and just like all of those emotions coming together, I will admit that I got a little teary. 
Oh, yeah, for sure. And, like, you know, it was kind of meta, because, like, this version of us will not exist anymore. And I'm just like, oh, no, they won't. Because the show got canceled. Mm Mm-hmm. Dang. (laughs) Oh, my, man. My babies, man. My babies. I I can't help but think of that, um, that seal meme where he just crying yep oh man okay so just final thoughts and then we get into plug time honestly which uh this show all throughout oh my bad i was just gonna say sorry real quick by the way typically guys uh show format we would now spend now talking about speculation but you know canceled unfortunately um so yeah uh final thoughts and then we get into plug time so Loved this series through and through. It just kept getting better and better. And honestly, it ended pretty solidly. And, you know, with what they had, I am glad this show, you know, had the run it did. Um, and honestly, I'm just glad this show existed, period. So, thank God. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, as a fan, this is all I could all I could have asked for and more. As wow. someone who is only like Wikipedia familiar with the comics. I freaking loved this show. It's it was weird. It was cool. It was science, but it was also magic, and they never let one outshine the other. And it was just <clears throat> parents and kids, and the kids justfully run ran away, but. Then the parents, like, actually slowly over time started to become good, and it was just really good, and it had a lot of great action and a lot of great comedy. One of the things that we didn't bring up was, I love the ongoing joke of, like, so is our secret hostel not secret anymore? Yep. And it's just like... And I also love, like, hey, Nico, is there a mind wipe spell? And then Gert's like, please don't say mind wipe. That word is triggering for me now. And it's just like... What? And then, and then, of course, for the series finale, you got to introduce time travel so that you can relive the first episode, like legit the first episode. And yep. also, you notice the parallels there for the first episode to the finale? Yeah. The, the team split up because one of them died. Yep. Because Nick, uh, yeah, because the team split up because Amy died in the first episode. Oh, well, not in the first episode, but like you know, in, in yeah, the, prior to that. Um, and then the team split up because Gert died. Yeah. Also, I didn't get to mention this. I mean, I briefly mentioned it, but we got a little shout out to Julie Power from the Power Pack. Please give us a Power Pack show. I have a whole pitch that I we did a, actually did a channel station episode on. Um, I have a cast. I have a premise. Well, I'm glad have, you have a cast because that version of Julie is no longer. Yep. Because they fixed the timeline and Denoru yep. was reestablished. Which but, I'm totally fine with. But by the way. But yeah. Also one other thing that we didn't mention that quickly want to bring up. The two dream characters that were awesome and badass. Uh, no, Dark Dimension characters. Amy. Yeah. Amy slash Quentin. Yes. Quentin the Great. He was awesome. They were awesome. Yep. And it's just, it was so awesome to see an a male, uh, and this is going to sound weird, but it was awesome to see a male American, like, wielding magic in this universe, because we hadn't seen that yet. Yep. Yep, that was but. cool. Um, so yeah, uh, we love the show. We're sad it ended, but we're glad we at least got to cover the final season. Um, now it's uh, the podcast where we get to talk about plugs. But before we get to that, we actually do have an official Gmail. So if you guys want to give us feedback or give us your own thoughts about Runaways and tell us what you thought about the season, 
we'll definitely have a segment on the show this point from this point on feedback. Um, and that email is channel chasers podcast at gmail. That's channel chasers podcast at gmail.com. Uh, we look forward to reading your feedback though. It's, it's I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Indeed. Uh, so plug time. Honestly, it's the holiday season. Um, there isn't going to be mm. much for either of us. Uh, literally all our shows are on hiatus, uh, or over. Uh, the only things that, uh, either of us are going to be covering are Harley Quinn, High School Musical, the musical, the series, and for me, uh, Steven Universe. And I'm probably going to do a review of The Witcher pretty soon. Uh, I'm actually going to start that after uh, probably tomorrow. So look forward and to that I'm, on my Blair channel. Uh, which and, I'm probably gonna do, and I'm probably going to try to do something gear indie, uh, if not this week, next week. Yep, and a link to Brian's YouTube channel will be also featured in the description below as well. Uh, So definitely check him out. Uh, I promise if you enjoy his, uh, you know, interjections in the podcast, uh, you'll definitely enjoy him when I don't cut him off. (laughs) But, uh, and, and FYI, I'm not always the optimist. That one. Yep. But but yeah, also check out Jay's Lair. Yeah, it's a brand new site, very similar to YouTube. Uh, as I kept, you know, mentioning under my breath, YouTube kind of fucked me over. But honestly, it's kind of a blessing in disguise. This is how I discovered like, and decided to like fully go into podcasting, and also you know do the do Vlair. And speaking of podcasting, if you want early access, so you can get this audio. A day before anyone else, before it even goes up on, uh, you know, um, Anchor or Spotify or any of the other hosting platforms that we have the podcast on, become a patron today, which will also be linked in the description. A lot of links in the description, but it's only a dollar a month and you'll get early access to the audio if you really do enjoy the podcast. Again, you're not obligated to, but, you know, it's rough out here for us creators, so every dollar counts and I appreciate the help. Uh, So... We hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of Channel Chasers. And until next time, uh, be ready to talk about, you know, hopefully a good video game adaptation next week. See ya. Peace.